Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. When we last talked, you learned all about the periodic table and the reason it has its odd shape. In the next few videos, I'll tell you about how we can use the periodic table to predict some of the properties of atoms and ions. It's part of what makes the periodic table such a useful tool for chemists. To begin, let's remember a bit about the structure of atoms, which we learned about in previous videos. As you might recall, an atom has a positively charged nucleus in the center and shells of electrons around it. I'm going to draw those shells as circles, but remember, an electron behaves like a wave, so the electrons are spread throughout orbitals, not like balls orbiting in a circular path, like I'm drawing here. Now suppose we have a helium atom. From the periodic table, we know that its nucleus will have two protons, so it has a charge of plus two. It also has two electrons, and from the previous two videos, you know that those are both in the n equal 1 shell. As you probably know, the positive charge on the nucleus pulls the electrons toward it. The important thing to notice here is that there's nothing between the electrons in this helium atom and the nucleus, so each electron feels the entire nucleus pulling it toward the center. But now let's look at the next atom on the periodic table, lithium. Lithium has three protons and three electrons. Two of the electrons are in the n equals one shell. But as you learned in earlier videos, the next electron is in the n equals two shell. Just like last time, the two inner electrons feel the full charge on the nucleus pulling them in. But unlike those electrons, the outer electron is blocked by the electrons in the inner shell. We say that the outer electron is shielded by the electrons that are between it and the nucleus. Since the nucleus has a charge of plus three, but there are two inner electrons blocking it, the outer electron only feels a nuclear charge of about plus one. This is known as the effective nuclear charge. It's a bit more complicated than that. As you'll learn in inorganic chemistry and physical chemistry courses, the effective nuclear charge is actually a bit higher than plus one, but in this class, you can get a good estimate of the effective nuclear charge by just taking the charge on the nucleus and subtracting the number of electrons between it and the electron you're interested in. For example, take magnesium. It has 12 electrons. If you write the electron configuration for magnesium, you find that it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. So, there are a total of two electrons in the first shell, eight in the second, and two in the third. The electrons in each shell feel a different effective nuclear charge. Take the first shell, for example. There's nothing between these electrons and the nucleus, so they feel the full charge of plus 12 from the nucleus. On the other hand, the electrons in the second shell are blocked by the two electrons that are closer in, so they only feel an effective nuclear charge of plus 10. And finally, the electrons in the third shell are being blocked by the eight electrons in the middle and also the two electrons in the first shell. So there are a total of 10 electrons in the way. That means the two outer electrons only feel an effective nuclear charge of plus two. Why is that important? Well, you might remember that when we talked about electron configurations, we saw that the inner electrons are called core electrons, and the outermost electrons are valence electrons. And I mentioned that it's the valence electrons that do most of the interesting chemistry in chemical reactions. You can see why that's the case if you look at the effective nuclear charges. For example, in magnesium, the valence electrons only feel a pull of plus two from the nucleus. The core electrons feel a much larger attraction, either plus 10 for the electrons in the second shell or plus 12 for the electrons in the first. That means that the valence electrons aren't held to the atom very tightly. It's fairly easy to take them away from the atom, but much harder to take away a core electron. That's what happens in many chemical reactions. One or more valence electrons escapes and goes to a different atom. And the effective nuclear charges are also important for many properties of atoms and ions. 
We said that the effect of nuclear charge is lower for the outer electrons of an atom because they're shielded by the inner electrons. Those electrons block some of the positive charge of the nucleus. It turns out that the effect of nuclear charge that the valence electrons feel has a huge impact on many properties of atoms and ions. We'll talk about four of those properties. The atomic radius, the ionization energy, the electron affinity, and the electronegativity. We'll talk about the first one, atomic radius, in this video, and the others in the next two videos. As you might expect, the radius of an atom increases as we go down a column of the periodic table. This is because, as we go down, the value of n increases, which means the number of electron shells increases. So, for example, if we look at the atoms in this column, the value of n increases from n equals 2 up to n equals 7, and the atomic radius also increases from 82 picometers up to 180 picometers. A picometer is a trillionth of a meter. So, atoms get larger as we go down the periodic table, but what about when we move from left to right? This time, to understand the change in the atomic radius, we need to think about the effect of nuclear charge on the valence electrons. Take the second row of the periodic table, for example. Each of these atoms has its valence electrons in the n equals 2 shell. Lithium has three protons in all, so its nucleus has a charge of plus 3. However, as we found out, the two inner electrons shield some of this charge so that the valence electron only feels an effect of nuclear charge of plus one. On the other hand, the nucleus of neon has 10 protons, so it has a charge of plus 10. But the valence electrons are shielded by the two electrons closer to the nucleus, so they only feel an effect of nuclear charge of plus eight. If we apply the same logic to all the atoms in the row, you can see that the effect of nuclear charge increases as we go left to right. So how does that affect the radius? Well, the more the nucleus pulls on the valence electrons, the closer those electrons move to the nucleus. So the atom is smaller the more the nucleus pulls on the electrons. So neon, which feels a strong pull from the nucleus, is smaller than lithium. As you can see, lithium has a radius of 134 picometers, and the radius decreases to 69 picometers as we go to the right. So the atomic radius is higher as we go to the left on the periodic table and as we go down. So let's try an example. Suppose we have atoms of strontium, phosphorus, aluminum, cesium, and fluorine. Let's put these in order from smallest radius to largest. The first thing we need to do is find each of these on the periodic table. So here are the strontium, phosphorus, aluminum, cesium, and fluorine. Now that we've done that, we just need to remember that the atoms get larger as we go down and to the left. So fluorine is the smallest, and then phosphorus, then aluminum, then strontium, and cesium is the largest. And we find that the actual data confirms it. Of these five, fluorine is the smallest at 71 picometers, and cesium is the largest at 225. Now, what happens when we create ions instead of neutral atoms? For example, suppose we have a neptunium atom, which has a radius of 155 picometers. In order to create a cation, we have to remove electrons. As you might expect, when we remove electrons, the radius of the ion decreases. So in this series of Neptunium ions, the radius decreases until it reaches 85 picometers for the Neptunium plus 7 ion. The reverse is true when we make anions. We do that by adding electrons to an atom. So, for example, the radius of an iodine atom is 133, but when we add an electron to it, the radius of an I minus ion is 206 picometers. And that's it for now. Next time, we'll talk about a couple more properties that are affected by the effective nuclear charge, and those properties are especially useful for determining the energies of certain chemical reactions. So until next time, have a good week.